morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Glad to have you here this morning. Again, I'm Pastor Mike Easter. And this morning we begin a new message series. We just finished up James last week. And if there's one thing we learned from James's letter, it's that our tongues, as representatives of our speech, can get us into big trouble. James called the tongue boastful, a fire, a world of unrighteousness, a stain on the whole body, a fire starter, untamable, a restless evil, and full of deadly poison, or in my life, what I refer to as high school. Speaking of high school, as far back as then, I've often wished that I could script out my entire life and conversations. That way I would always say the right thing at the right time. That's what I always wanted to do, the right thing, say the right thing at the right time. Sometimes I would have whole conversations in my head with people. I mean, real people, but imagining I was having conversations with them, not imaginary people in my head. Um, I talked real good in those conversations, but in real life, not so much. I didn't know Jesus in high school, but once I got to know him and read about him in the Bible, it seemed like he always said the right things at the right times. So that confirmed to me that speaking well is a good goal, one that I am still working on today and still failing at sometimes. Now though, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, my life has changed and I have help in using my words for good. In fact, even a better goal in using my words for good, which is to honor God rather than just glorify myself. And I get to share that help with others from the Bible. Now I could tell you, well, the Bible says, talk real good, uh, don't curse and such, and, and uh, you know, leave it things at that, and that would be my instruction. But uh, I think we could do a little better than that, and so that's why we're going to look at Proverbs 15 for the next few weeks, as it has some godly wisdom on how to use our words to build up relationships and honor God. The series is titled Speaking Wisdom, and today's message is soothing words. Before we get into it, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for your word and for your son Jesus Christ who died on the cross in our place for our sins so that we might not perish and be condemned forever because of those sins, but by believing in Jesus, by accepting this offer of forgiveness, we can have eternal life with you in heaven, a life that begins now here on earth it gives us a greater goal and a greater glory of honoring you and not just ourselves. So help us today as we look at speaking wisdom with soothing words from your word, the Bible in Proverbs 15. Bless this time, bless us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Speaking wisdom with soothing words means answering to diffuse anger. And if we look at chapter one of Proverbs 15, it says a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The way one answers another person will influence the response. To use a harsh word is to cause pain and bring an angry response. Yes, words can hurt. But a soft response not only avoids wrath, but restores good temper and reasonableness. This is not easy in a situation that's charged with a potential for anger and requires self-control on the part of the soft answerer. We might have to bite our tongue and instead of saying what we want to say, say something better, softer. Thankfully, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, so a Christian indwelt with the Holy Spirit can have the self-control necessary to turn back and not stir up potentially damaging, foolish emotion that destroys social relationships. In this verse, the thought is that the anger of the first speaker can be set aside or calmed with a gentle response. In other words, reply to a person with gentle words and you will calm their anger. In contrast, a harsh word is one that is spoken sharply or heatedly, causes pain and stirs up anger. We don't want to do that one. We want to speak the soft answer. To illustrate how a soft answer can turn away wrath, we can look at 1 Samuel 25. It's a great story in the Bible. The story of David and Nabal. Nabal, whose name means fool. 
and Nabal's wife Abigail. In this story, we see both the soft answer and the harsh one. You know, David was a fugitive running away from King Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. And so he's hiding out in the wilderness with all of his band of merry men. And while there, he and his men protect Nabal's shepherds and sheep from harm. So along comes shearing time, and David sends a few guys down to Nabal, who's shearing sheep. Because when you shear sheep, you also slaughter a couple and have a little party. And he says to, uh, says to the guys he sends, hey, you know, tell Nabal, we protected your guys, you didn't lose anything. How about a little something in return? So when they ask for this payment of food in return, Nabal insulted David. He's like, so many people are running away from their masters, I don't... Who's David? Who is this guy? He's a, he's a thug. He's a criminal. Why should I give him anything? I'm not giving you anything. No food for you. So he sends the guys, David's men, away. Now, I mean, we can look at this as like, you know, David's running a reverse protection racket rather than saying, hey, Nabal, give us payment and we'll protect you from us and others. He's saying, hey, we protected you. Now pay us or we're going to attack you. <laughs> That's kind of what David decides to do. He gets angry at Nabal's response, you know. Not that David was angry in the first place, but certainly Nabal's response made him angry. And he says, strap on your swords. If uh, by the end of the day there's any male left alive in Nabal's household, may God strike me dead, in essence. Paraphrasing there. Um, but that's the response, like, you, you know, you treat me like dirt, I'm going to kill you. An angry response. And so as the men are marching down, Abigail, Nabal's wife, hears about this and packs up a bunch of food and rushes out to meet David. And on the road, she meets David and says, Lord, I'm sorry, my husband's a fool. In fact, I think, uh, you know, Nabal is the character that pretty much every husband in every television sitcom is modeled on. The idiot husband, right? So Abigail rushes out, meets David. Hey, Lord, please forgive Nabal. He's an idiot. Uh, you should have come to me. Uh, here, here's all this food. Thank you for taking care of us. We appreciate it. You know, God bless you. And this soft answer of Abigail's turns away David's wrath and he relents and uh, away he goes. And of course, as the story wraps up, Nabal is told once he wakes up from his drunken stupor, you know, you almost died today, uh, but uh, because of your harsh word to David, uh, but you didn't, and he has basically a heart attack, and like 10 days later or something, dies stone dead, and of course David says, Abigail's a pretty wise woman and not a bad looker, so I'm going to marry her, and that's what he ends up doing, takes another wife. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Most proverbs are contrasts like this. Uh, showing the way of the wise and the way of the fool. And through these pithy sayings, we are taught the correct way to live if we want to follow God, and the foolish way if we don't, and the way many people do live their lives. So in speaking wisdom with soothing words, we not only seek to diffuse a tense situation and someone's anger, but we hope to teach wisdom through our words. That's, that's the goal. We want to show a better way uh, most things, you know, conflict, but through our soft answer, we want to teach a better way. Social interactions, business dealings, they almost always have some element of conflict. I mean, especially business, you want to get the best deal. You don't necessarily want to give the best deal, so you're in it for yourself. And so that's going to cause conflict and, and, of course, a difference of opinion, because what's best for me it might not be what you think is good enough for me. But conflict can be aggravated with our words or it can be calmed depending on how we answer. Life is relationships and we want to make the most of them. So to turn away wrath, we should seek to find a response that benefits and honors the other party, that benefits and honors God, and that benefits and honors ourselves. Or as one of my professors, very wise man himself, says the triple win. They win, we win, God wins, everybody wins. When everybody wins, everybody is happy. And those are the kind of answers that we want to get. But that's difficult to do on our own power, uh, especially when our hearts are the way they are. They need changing to better align with God. 
And because Jesus, you know, said what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, that's in Matthew 12. And so we need our hearts changed so that what comes out of our mouth is the good stuff, the godly stuff that honors and glorifies and benefits everyone. Followers of Jesus should always reflect on the effects of our words. Like think about the things we said, and, or better yet, before we say them. And, and uh, we should also take the next step and examine the intentions and desires of the heart from which those words come, meaning our own. We don't want to just do behavior modification and try to speak better, but we want to change, be changed through the power of the Holy Spirit, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have what's in our heart be the good stuff that comes out, not just monitor our words and try and control them. So speaking wisdom with soothing words means answering to diffuse anger, and it means the second thing, making knowledge attractive. And that's in verse two. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Now knowledge comes from the wise and folly from fools. The word commends means like treat good, or treat in a good or excellent way. So not just going, hey, knowledge is great, right? That would be commending knowledge, but they like treat knowledge in a good, or excellent way. It can be pictured as a, as a dripping. Um, the tongues of the sages drip with knowledge, someone wrote, um, versus the pouring out of folly. And, and you know, in picturing it that way, the knowledge that we share re repeatedly over time and in small doses is the stuff that's going to be remembered. You can, you know, have the most excellent speech to your kid or to your uh, employees or to whomever you are trying to instruct. Uh, and if you only do it once, it's forgotten. But if over time you continually drip, drip, drip this knowledge out, you are commending knowledge, not just <laughs> spewing it out. Usually when knowledge is spewed out, it's not very good knowledge. So basically we're seeing that a wise person uses knowledge well and fools don't. Now I should add at this point that wisdom, right, the wisdom, what we're looking for, uh, can be defined as the ability to use knowledge well or the knowledge of what is proper and reasonable. Now when a wise person speaks, they share knowledge in a beneficial way. The contrast to the proverb to the wise person is the fool who pours out or gushes folly. One can distinguish the wise and foolish by what their mouths produce. The wise will speak words of wisdom at the right time, in the right amount, and for the right reasons, and I could also add for, to the right audience. Meanwhile, fools will just babble on about anything and everything at all. The fool speaks without consideration or discretion. He bubbles over like a boiling pot, pouring out its contents uselessly, because that's what happens, right? That's a good illustration of a fool pouring out folly, a pot of knowledge that's boiling over. It's just boiling over and spilling. There might be good stuff in there that's spilling out, but once it bubbles over and spills on the stove, it's wasted. You, you can't, it's a mess. You can't put it back in. You just gotta clean it up and move on. But the wise person, their tongue commends knowledge. They treat knowledge in a good or excellent way. Knowledge being the stuff that's in that pot, right? A pot of knowledge. You're cooking it up. They stir it. They simmer it. Taste it. When it's just right, they serve it up in a dish to the one who is hungry for knowledge. They don't just boil over with this stuff. I think about, uh, and I know, well, it's a fictional character, so who cares if I hurt his feelings, but uh, in the 80s, 80s, yeah, sitcom uh, Cheers. There was Cliff Clavin, the mailman. And he was that kind of fool that just gushes folly. I mean, he would, very knowledgeable, all kinds of stuff, trivia. Uh, it's a little known fact, and, and, but it wasn't very relevant to what was happening at the time. It was a tangent, it was a distraction. That's the kind of fool. And then I think about also on that show, Coach. And you think, Coach, well, he was kind of the dim-witted guy who'd been hit in the head too many times with a baseball. But when Coach finally spewed out a little wisdom, it was wisdom. 
It was good knowledge. He didn't do it very often, but he did it when it was right. Making knowledge attractive means serving it up when it is needed and desired and in a way that honors the other person, you and God. Don't be arrogant with your knowledge. Don't force it on others. Don't make the other person feel stupid when you share your knowledge. Perhaps restating the proverb will help. The speech of the wise makes knowledge lovely, while the mouth of fools spout nonsense. As Jesus said, go and do likewise. That's your goal for this week. Don't be a know-it-all, but share what you know when it's needed. Now, speaking wisdom with soothing words is diffusing anger. It is making knowledge attractive. And number three, it promotes spiritual healing. And this is in verse 4, where it says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. What a person says can bring healing or harm. Healing words bring life to the spirit, but perverseness, excuse me, but perverse words crush the spirit. Isaiah 65, 14 uses that same phrase, breaking of spirit. It's nearly identical to this proverb, so it kind of suggests that what we're talking about here is the effect one's words have on morale. That's the main point. Uh, we can infer that speech that does damage even is deceitful, the perverseness, the twisting of those words, uh, and by implication then speech that heals is truthful. One is a tree of life, the other a twisted, crooked branch. Wholesome, gentle, truthful speech heals and nourishes a person, whereas the perversion or twisting of truth causes trouble in the spirits of both the liar, um, who further separates from God through their lying, and in the person to whom the liar lies. The word tongue here in verse 4 ties back to verse 2, that also used the word tongue, and it draws this section of the value of soothing speech to a close by noting the power of the tongue to heal hurtful speech. Gentle, wise, truthful, healing speech is often lacking in our broken and sinful world. But when it does happen, it reminds us of the tree of life. The tree of life that sprouts and gives life. The tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life that will be again in the new heaven and new earth. It's listed in Genesis, it's listed in Revelation, and it's listed here in Proverbs, this tree of life. And that increases our desire to restore paradise in a broken world through healing speech. Jesus healed in several different ways in the gospel. Sometimes it was simply his word that healed someone, at times becoming literal life-giving words. Arise, he would say to the dead people. Lazarus, come out, who had been dead for four days, rose from the dead at the, the words, the healing words that came from Jesus. Other times he would add a few things, such as touching a person. We think about all the blind people that he healed in the Gospels. Uh, some, he said, what do you want to have my sight? Boom, done, you're healed. Uh, another time he touched the man's eyes and said something, and the man was healed. Another time he spit in the dirt and made mud and applied it to the man's eyes and said, hey, go wash in the pool of Siloam and you will be healed. So there's different ways that he did it. And one of the most powerful ones was the thief on the cross who said, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus' response was, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Healing words, that thief then was prepared to die because he knew that he would be with Jesus. So the power of words to spiritually heal cannot be overstated. It may not be as instantaneous and miraculous as when Jesus healed, but definitely over time, in that dripping, our words can improve someone's spirit. Conversely, uh, it can beat them down. If you repeatedly make derogatory jokes by your spouse or friend or child, they will remember those words and their life, their spirit will be beaten down, crushed, broken. But if you continually affirm and build up and encourage people, that too 
will happen. They will be spiritually healed, spiritually healthy, spiritually whole by the power of words. So this week to do that, try complimenting everyone you talk to this week. Not, you know, superficial things. Oh, gee, you look nice today. Go for specific things. I really like that coat on you. I really like that haircut. I think you look beautiful today. If it's someone you've known for a while, share with them something you really admire or like about them. Might not be happening right at that time, but you know, hey, you know, I really like the way you're always willing to jump in and help. I appreciate that, even though there's nothing to help with right now. Or, and or, try saying thank you every single time someone does something for you. We went out yesterday uh, for lunch for Faith's birthday, and I didn't necessarily do this, but I was thinking about it, you know. Uh, the server comes and seats you at the table. Thank you. They bring your water. Thank you. They bring, uh, they take your order. Thank you. They bring your, your dish. Thank you. They take away your dish. Thank you. They bring you the bill. Thank you. It, you know, it, it, we don't say it often enough. We don't thank people or show appreciation often enough. And so these are kind of soothing, healing words. And so to wrap up soothing words from Proverbs 15, we go back to verse 3, which says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now we went 1, 2, 4, and now back to 3. And 1, 2, 4 was all about speech and talking. Um, I didn't forget or skip verse 3. I go, oh, why is that there? I didn't. It's there. Uh, as the, the writer, the organizer, the editor of Proverbs, you know, speech, speech, a reminder about God and speech. And now we're done with this little section, uh, these four verses. God is everywhere or omnipresent. He sees all, he knows all, that's omniscient. And he knows everyone completely. So verse three is inserted here as a reminder of this theological truth that God is everywhere. But more importantly, is put there as an incentive for our conduct. God is everywhere watching, so diffuse anger, share knowledge well, give healing words, not harmful words. If God is everywhere watching and listening, our desire should be to show him how we are using our tongues to speak wisdom, to bring his kingdom into this sinful world. The world's full of people who use speech poorly, who use it as a weapon. But we, in our words, should provide soothing words. These are kingdom words. This honor and glorifies God, who, as again, verse 3 says, is everywhere watching, keeping watch on the evil and the good. As we live life, as we share the gospel, as we build our relationships, all of these things need soothing words spoken wisely. And this is the wisdom that we get from Proverbs 15 today. Soothing words that heal, that calm, that build up and edify. So I pray this week we will do those things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. And indeed, uh, Jesus, thank you for Again, dying on the cross in our place for our sins. And Holy Spirit, thank you for coming and dwelling inside of us to guide us and direct us and encourage us to give us the words that we need when we can't think of them ourselves. I pray that our words uh, this week and, and on and on would be soothing words. Uh, we learn from Proverbs that we would exercise self-control, that we would seek uh, the triple win in our relationships through our words, and that you would give us everything we need to do that. And that as those things, uh, as our speech pours out, as our relationships grow, uh, may we sing your praises and point everyone to you. This is the reason for the healing. God who loves, who loved enough to send his son to die for the world. That through believing in him, we might have forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, and better relationships with people. We love you, Lord, and thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.